Many of you have heard Dr. Raymond in the past few years that we've been, uh, been able to uh, not exactly drag him out here because it's always a great pleasure for him to come and it's a great pleasure for us to host him. Um, we, we do work together at the academy, uh, teaching some classes and working with some scholarship students. Um, but it's always, uh, uh, Ray and I worked together when I was running the World Affairs Council in Pittsburgh. So World Affairs Councils are, are near and dear to his heart and we couldn't imagine him being here without also offering to speak to, uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, the topic is a bit different this year. Uh, we have a presidential election year coming up, and we have a great tradition uh, over the last several years of bipartisanship in domestic and foreign policy. <laughs> so Ray and I thought that maybe the question we should answer, ask is whether it's even possible for the United States to have a bipartisan foreign policy. For those of you who have not heard Ray, uh, you're, you're, I mean, all of you are in for a treat, but some of you may not know how good of a treat uh, you're in for. Uh, Ray, Dr. Ray Raymond is a, uh, a former British diplomat, and that great British diplomatic tradition of keeping experts in one place so they can get to know everybody and everything all around. And so for about 15 years, Ray was the political officer, that's not a euphemism for MI6 or MI5, um, it was the political officer at the British Consulate General in New York. And that meant that he knew everybody and everything in that very important part of the United States outside of Washington. And um, if anybody came to the United States from the British political elite, private or public, uh, governmental or non-governmental, um, they ended up getting briefed by Ray. Um, and this became particularly important in, important in the wake of 9-11 when virtually everybody who was anybody in Britain descended upon New York and Ray was hosting them and briefing them and introducing them to anybody and everybody that they needed to know. So this is one of the most connected uh, gentlemen that I have. A very close relationship for much of those 15 years. Prime Minister was Tony Blair. Uh, they are friends. He had a direct line to number 10 very good friends with people in number 10 Downing Street. So this was someone who had a very important voice in British-American relations over those years. His PhD is uh, in contemporary American history from the University of Kansas, where he met his bride, did a Humphrey Fellowship and a postdoc at Yale. Um, and I was just simply say, I know of no one who is more thoughtful, more well-read, uh, more knowledgeable about American politics, he is, yes, he's a Brit, uh, about American politics as well as transatlantic relations and international relations. Uh, no one simply uh, more well-read um, than Ray. Also, um, unparalleled, if you have any questions about um, the Beatles or um, 007, about which he's also the world's greatest expert. Um, he has been honored by the Duke of York. Uh, he, was, he was a speechwriter for the Duke of York. Uh, he was uh, awarded uh, the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen for his services uh, uh, for Her Majesty's government. Um, he has a long relationship uh, at the U.S. Military Academy Department of Social Sciences uh, at West Point. Um, he was the Thomas Hawkins Johnson Visiting Professor at West Point uh, in 19, uh, 2009. Um, and the list goes on of the consulting jobs. He's the founding uh, the founder of the Goldman, initially sponsored by Goldman Sachs, their City Fellows Program. And of course, I almost forgot to mention, Ray, the fact that we worked together very closely uh, on the New York Committee, Selection Committee for the Marshall Scholarship. Um, so Ray and I have conspired a little bit like voting in Chicago early and often. And um, without any further ado, it is my uh, great pleasure to reintroduce to this group uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ray Ray. Good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Um, thank you, Sky, for that wonderful um, introduction. And I can only reply with the immortal words of Mark Twain when someone introduced him in similarly generous terms. And they were, you deserve to go to heaven for your generosity, hang on, hang on, and to the other place for your exaggeration. <laughs> a more accurate version of my nefarious past 
can be found on the FBI's most wanted list. <laughs> since uh, the Navy SEALs took down bin Laden, and since the FBI themselves got my old pal Whitey Bulger, um, you know, I've been sort of moved up the list. Easier to find, yeah? Easier to find. Um, you can also, by the way, check the MI6 website. Um, there you will find that I am actually 003. Um, licensed to? Licensed to bore, you all to tears. But I assure you, not this evening. Um, because indeed, this evening, we have, of course, gathered here to um, mark the um, 50th anniversary of the complete British conquest of America. <laughs> by, by the Beatles by four young men from Liverpool, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Actually, this summer, 50 years ago, this summer, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, the Beatles did an astonishing tour of America. They played uh, 29 concerts in nearly 30, they, sorry, they played 28 concerts in 26 cities. Murder, and it culminated in the famous concert at Shea Stadium in New York before 55,000 people. It was the biggest pop concert of its time ever, still one of the biggest actually, and it launched the whole idea of playing pop, pop music into, um, into large audiences. By the way, as Paul himself said afterwards, it can't have sounded terribly good because he said we were all mic'd up to go through the public address system, so, and besides he said we had 55,000 people screaming all, all, the, all the time, so it couldn't have sounded all, all that good, but there you go. Um, can I also remind you, by the way, that this um, summer also marks the, um, the 50th anniversary of the release of the Beatles' second film, Help. Um, much, actually much, I think, underrated. It's a very clever satire of um, British society with, of course, those great songs. You know, help, we need somebody, help. We need some, anybody. But it's great stuff. Anyway, enough fun and frivolity. Enough fun and frivolity. Let us get down to business. Um, this is, I gather, an evening of experiments. So I'm going to give you an experiment as well because this is something you've never heard before. It's called a speech in two voices, in two voices, not one, but in two voices, mine and Sky's. Um, it's unusual because, um, and let me just explain this, Sky and I are writing a piece together, um, which we'll submit foreign affairs, foreign, foreign uh, policy.com, all this, with a view of suggesting what a bipartisan, not Democrat, not Republican, a bipartisan set of principles governing US foreign policy might look like, right? Govern what they might actually look like. Um, Sky and I are working on this. Now, he made a terrific um, contribution, got us off to a great start, with a speech he gave recently to the World Affairs Council down um, in Corpus Christi, Texas, which was super. And in it, he set out five, I thought, really excellent principles that I very much agree with. And um, what I have done is to help with our joint drafting I've incorporated Sky's five points, and I've added to them. I've expanded them, grown them, elaborated them, made one or two of them a bit more hawkish, a bit more hawkish, just a little bit, uh, because you should know that both Sky and I are of the Brent Scowcroft School. Brent Scowcroft, the great national security advisor under, um, under President George H.W. Bush, 41. Dad. <laughs> Dad. Okay, so that's what we've done, and I've added some further principles of my own to them. And I think, taken together, if I think we have a joint philosophy, and I was hoping for some words to, to, um, to wrap them around in, it would be, I suppose, enlightened realism. Okay, enlightened realism. That's how I think I would describe our approach. Okay, now, Stroke Talbot wrote in the late 1996 when he was Deputy Secretary of State, and he said, in an now the course President of Brookings, in an increasingly interdependent world, Americans have a growing stake in how other countries govern or misgovern themselves. Okay, but since the 1990s, we've been coping with this, this sort of dualism because on the one hand, we say we want to promote democracy and free and free markets, okay? But on the other hand, we say we want to promote security and stability. Now, frankly, these two differing, these two objectives are contradictory. They are, they are contradictory. And although we want to pursue both of them, we need to understand that promoting one is usually at the expense of the other. 
And so America's real challenge is going to have to be to balance its pursuit of these objectives with the recognition of both assets and limitations of American power. It may well be that we may have to limit ourselves to a, a strict enforcement of the rules-based order that we currently have, and no more domestic um, interventions. We'll have to wait and see. So let me begin by setting out the first of these principles. This is Sky's original idea. I've elaborated um, upon it. And it's a great one. He called it, we don't have the luxury of ignorance. OK? We don't have the luxury of ignorance. I like that. I, I like it a lot. But it didn't stop me in the spirit of John and Paul of tweaking it a little bit. Um, I was calling it also knowledge matters. Right? Knowledge and insight matters. Now, there's no question, certainly in our minds, that the United States must continue to provide global leadership. We have a responsibility to do so. And for all America's faults over the years, it's done a darn good job of it, on the whole. And indeed, as Bob Kagan has quipped, um, Sky, uh, superpowers don't get to take vacations. Sorry, superpowers do not get to take vacations. Um, to continue to provide global leadership, we need to anticipate to understand and to weigh all the problems, even if it's not always going to be us to provide all the solutions. But we can't afford blind spots. We can't afford parts of the world we don't know things about. Knowledge, lack of knowledge, always comes back to bite you. To avoid these sort of blind spots, I believe the one thing we need to do is we need diplomatic insight, intelligence analysis presented to policymakers and particularly to the president without any prism of hyperpartisan politics. To do this, we need no more cocoons of campaign operatives around the president filtering analysis that's rooted in the long-term security interests of the United States. Now, to be fair, I mean, every administration's done this. Of course they have. Of course they have. But under this administration, it's become especially bad. I mean, do you really want Valerie Jarrett running foreign policy? No. Thank you very much. But the point is, too many campaign operatives filtering analysis Diplomatic analysis, strategic analysis, military analysis, through the prism of hyperpartisan politics. Enough is enough. Every administration is guilty of this, but as Robert Gates' wonderful book, which I commend to you with great enthusiasm, Leon Panetta's book, which I commend to you with great enthusiasm, as they both make clear, the Obama administration has taken this to a new extreme. And this has to stop. It is absolutely vital that the number of campaign operatives in national security roles in the White House either be eliminated or trimmed to the absolute bare bones. We've had enough of this. It is vital that they be minimized, and it's also vital, I believe, that the role of national security advisor be taken, basically be put in the hands of a career professional, as in the case of General Scowcroft, who was never a campaign operative for anybody, right? Anybody. We need a national security advisor who's a, perhaps a career diplomat, career CIA officer, career military officer, enough partisan politics. Uh, we've had way too much of it. And it's no coincidence, as I've said, that the greatest, I think within the national security community generally, we all believe certainly that our greatest national security advisor was Brent Scowcroft, a superb analyst who, by the way, with an NSC staff of only 50, is now up to 400. What do they find to do all day? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what they do. They interfere with commanders in the field. They interfere with ambassadors in the field. They basically, you know, need to be shut down, shut up, and shut out. Um, we need career professionals in there. And it's all the more important, I think, because it's no coincidence that we have actually um, failed to grasp and made a lot of mistakes in analysis over the past 15 or more years. If you stop to think about it for just a second, um, think about how much we got wrong 
in the past 15 to 20 years or so. Uh, and it's a lot. Uh, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction program. We got that one wrong. We got, we failed to grasp the extent of Iranian influence in Yemen, for example. We got that one wrong. Uh, the ISIS threat. I do not know who advised President Obama to say they're the junior varsity league. If they're the junior varsity, God help us. That was absolutely totally wrong. I, I personally believe that it was, it was badly filtered through a, through a political prism which was suggesting that, oh, we, we're winning the war on terror. Well, we're not. Certainly not by simply saying so. ISIS. Russian capabilities and intentions. Yeah? All of this means knowledge matters. And what it means also is human intelligence matters. I'm just reading a wonderful book, and I commend it to you, by Michael, Michael Morell. Mike Morell was deputy director of CIA. He's the Bob Gates of his generation. Impeccable, nonpartisan career officer, right? Served Democratic, Republican presidents alike. And he makes it clear, indeed, as I knew myself already, but I'm glad he made it, I'm glad he wrote it in the book, that you know, one of the fundamental reasons we got Saddam Hussein wrong was the failure to penetrate his inner circle. The failure to penetrate that inner circle. We did not have accurate human intelligence, neither the CIA, MI6, the two best intelligence services, nor even Mossad. Oh, I mean, those are the three best intelligence services in the world. And none of us were able to penetrate Saddam Hussein's inner circle. Knowledge matters, and human intelligence matters. Good diplomacy matters, right? in terms of understanding who people are, what makes them think, and what makes them think, and what makes them tick. So do we know what we need to know? Do we know what we think we know? I don't think we do. We need much greater emphasis on human intelligence. And knowledge really, really matters. Now, this spring, Sir Lawrence Friedman, one of the great grand strategists of all time, British, guy who runs, developed the wonderful war studies program at King's College in London, was here and he gave a wonderful lecture at the US Air Force Academy. And in it he made a remarkable statement, which might strike some of you as a bit odd, doesn't strike either of us as being odd, it's very simply this, quote, empathy is the most important strategic virtue. Let's think about that for a second, shall we? Empathy is the most important strategic virtue. It is, you know, it's the ability to listen. It's the ability to understand. It means, I'm sorry? Sorry, empathy is the most important strategic virtue. Virtue, right. Um, understanding problems means understanding the cultural and the political perspective of those with whom we are dealing. And not presuming that based on a projection of our own values. It isn't. Mirror imaging is always is hubris and often dangerous. And if I can give you an example of empathy as a strategic virtue, it is this. And this was at a time when America didn't need to be terribly empathetic. This was 1947. Mm -hmm. The US bestrode the world, right? Utterly bestrode the world. I mean, 56% of world GDP was American, right? It, it was artificial. It was artificial. It, it was always going to end. You know. It was always going to end because Japan, Germany, all the other countries of the world were going to come back. But still, empathy. The Truman administration understood that the United States had a vital national security interest in rebuilding war-torn Western Europe. Absolutely. Of course it did. To save it from starvation and despair, to save um, European democracies, to rebuild its economy, traditionally the most important export market for the United States. This was enlightened realism. This was called enlightened self-interest, right? That's what it was about. There were deep humanitarian impact. But given the stakes involved, and they were huge, obviously huge, given the stakes involved and given America's enormous economic might at the time, right? It could have been entirely forgiven for simply saying, okay, 
we're going to fund this, we're going to do it our way, right? We're going to do it the American way, that's it, you guys in Europe, just shut up and listen, we're just going to do it, right? But they didn't. Then Secretary of State, George Marshall, head of the State Department's Policy Planning Office, George Kennan, by the way, one of the most empathetic diplomats you could ever read, if you ever read some of his own writings, they're quite extraordinary, it's a wonderful feel for culture and so on. U.S. diplomats listened. They really listened. And to be frank, they didn't have to, but they did. They listened. And as a result, they understood the complex problems of post-World War II Europe. They understood European reconstruction in its cultural, political, and actually geoeconomic context. Because one of the requirements that they made very clear, they said, look, you guys go and organize yourselves in Europe, right? The British and French will share the meeting, and you'll do it in power. It's always a nice place to do it, right? Always a nice place to have these things. And you're going to come up with, tell us what you need. We're not going to tell you what we think you need, but tell us what you need. Oh, and by the way, the one little push is, we want you to think about this on a transcontinental basis. Europe-wide basis, Western Europe-wide, not just Britain or France or Italy or West Germany as it then was. No, you're all integrated and we're going to give you a little bit of a nudge towards European integration. Okay. Consequently, Kennan told the Europeans to come together under, and under British and French leadership so that they could determine what their needs were and how these needs could be met. And they were to be integrated. So come back to us with what you think you need your way. And, the United, and they did. And the US financed it to the tune, by the way, of $13 billion was the Marshall Plan. $13 billion. I mean, hard to factor in what it would be today. Um, probably in the hundreds of, hmm? a ton of money, certainly, a ton of money. I mean, one might even say, oh, good heavens, hundreds, I mean, it's probably about half a trillion dollars today but it achieved all of its objectives, every one of them. The result was fantastic. It was a Marshall Plan that laid the foundations for the European Union and European economic integration. It was a Marshall Plan that laid the foundations for the political, cultural rebirth of Western Europe, for the formation um, of the European Union, for the creation of a bulwark against Soviet aggression. Hey. Not bad going, eh? Not bad going. It was an extraordinary triumph of enlightened realism, of American, American foreign policy at its absolute best. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Super. Principle three. It's not always about us. Now, issues can sometimes be local, between tribes or between competing religious claims, over water, grazing rights, whatever. And not necessarily a challenge to the United States globally. If we assume that global conflicts are about us, they'll become so, and often to our, and often to our detriment. And sometimes, I think if we intervene too much in these tribal rivalries, we risk escalating. We, we end up turning them into bigger conflicts than they actually are. Indeed, I think oftentimes we run the risk of transforming what is essentially about a third order, maybe even a fourth order conflict, into full-blown deadly wars fought not with antique weapons, but rather with modern high-technology weapons that could destroy entire populations. You see what I mean? Interventions that we have to be very, very, very careful about. Now, number four. Power is not a zero-sum game. I'm not entirely sure you and I are entirely together on that one yet, but, 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 but we will be. There's been a great deal of debate about... Uh, okay. There's been a great deal of debate, of course, about the changing balance of global power, global financial and economic power, and the relative decline of the United States. I said relative decline of the, of the US. There can be no doubt that the balance of global financial and economic power has already begun to shift, some might even say has already shifted, to a very large degree from west to east. The days when we in the democratic club, the Atlantic community of the United States and Western Europe, when we called all the shots because we totally dominated the GDP of the world, those days, frankly, folks, are over. They're gone. They are 
gone already. By some indications, by some economists' calculations, China is already the world's largest economy. By others, China will become the world's largest economy in a couple of years. Now, one of the people that I read the most, he's Australian, Kevin Rudd, career Australian diplomat, then became Australian foreign minister, then became prime minister of Australia. He's one of the most astute observers of Asia. And I just want to quote briefly from what he said, what, what, he, sorry, what he's written very recently. To me, he's the most insightful non-American analyst of China's role in Asia. He wrote recently for the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and I quote, on the regional economic order, China's dominance over the US in every single bilateral trading relationship in Asia, its deployment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Silk Road Investment Fund, together with the normal operation of its sovereign wealth funds across the region, are creating a new economic reality in Asia of which, the most, of which most people in Washington remain blissfully unaware. The economic reality of Asia is changing under America's feet. Now, I think this is the United States. The United States can always come back, never underestimate the United States. But let's at least begin with acknowledging reality. The Chinese have cleaned our economic clock in Asia. They are really, they're dominating all those bilateral relationships. And, and by the way, the launch of that investment bank. Why did they do that? They were willing to work with us, but those wonderful enlightened folks in Congress would not respond to the sensible requests, both of the Bush administration and the Obama administration, both of whom said, hey, look, you know, China, this shift in global wealth has happened. We've really got to accommodate the Chinese. We've got to give them more voting power within the IMF. That's reality. Both administrations said this, and they're perfectly right. Congress, in its infinite wisdom, said no, and you end up with the Chinese building their own um, investment bank. And by the way, you know, with countries in Europe joining up, despite pleas from the US administration not to do so. Yeah. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think, is very important. And it will be completed now, although, my God, what a mess in Congress. But it may be, it could be, I may be wrong on this, I hope I am, it could be too little, too late, to help restore America's great economic um, hegemony in Asia. And it could be just in time to provoke yet another row with China, which is actually, of course, excluded from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, Kevin Rudd comments, turning to security, the US, of course, and these are, these are my words, the US remains the dominant military power in the Pacific. But don't grow too comfortable about that. The Chinese are building warships at a phenomenal rate, and we are not. A combination of severe budget cuts, sequestration, sounds painful, and it is. It's a monumentally stupid piece of, um, of legislation. A combination of sequestration cuts to the US defense budget, increased Chinese defense spending, are eroding our margin of safety. Are we still the dominant military power in the Pacific? Yes, we are. But our margin of safety and our margin of dominance is eroding, eroding, eroding really, really, really fast. Now, it will help the sooner the Pentagon shifts the bulk of the US Navy, basically, into the Pacific, the better. But it's difficult. Worse, of course, we have seen a more aggressive Chinese foreign policy, which has left our Asian allies nervous, to put it mildly. Managing and accommodating the rise of China will be the preeminent challenge, I think, facing American foreign policy in the next 40 to 50 years. But Sky and I believe, even though he's a bit more dovish on China and I'm a bit more hawkish, we do believe that it is possible that there are enough common points of interest for us to work together. For example, neither of us wants to see war happen. Neither of us wants to see unnecessary conflict of any kind occurring. But we believe that there are enough points of common interest to form the basis of a new strategic relationship with China. Above all, China and the United States both believe in international order and want to avoid conflict. But if we start that process assuming, right, assuming 
that there are no common interests, then we are surely heading down the road to war. And many of you may have been here kind enough to come last year to hear me talk about the lessons of 1914. We could be heading into a cataclysmic con conflict of 1914 scale again, and we do not want that to happen. Okay. Principle five. Diplomacy matters. You bet it does. Diplomacy really matters. But I've added quite a lot to your point, this guy, on this. A lot. But it requires patience. Yes, it does. But it also requires imagination and creativity. Huh? Imagination and creativity. It also requires the enforcement of presidential red lines. And the recognition, by the way, that military effort and diplomacy are not necessarily separate. They shouldn't be, exactly, exactly. That military effort is in fact, and can be, the enabler of diplomacy. All right, so, let's tackle that one. Diplomacy matters. Marion Webster's dictionary, I prefer the Queen's English, but Mr. Web and Mr. Webster's a lot, a lot to answer for, but still. Merriam Webster's dictionary defines diplomacy, and I quote, as the art and practice of conducting negotiations between nations. That's true up to a point. This definition is true insofar as it goes. But diplomacy is about much more than just conducting negotiations. It's about managing and, where possible, solving and being bold enough to try to solve international problems. By the way, going back to my relationship with Blair, I mean, Tony always believed that the problems of Northern Ireland, for example, didn't just have to be managed. They could be solved. And as you may have noticed, they have been solved. They can be solved. If, you're willing to if you really try hard enough, sometimes it can work. But nonetheless, it should not be just about managing problems. It should be about solving problems, right? Diplomacy is also about, and Joanne knows this as well as me, it's about persuading and building relationships of trust, not only with your sovereign government, but also with the opposition, also with the institutions of civic society, with its business community, its opinion formers and the media, its leading thinkers. That's the full spectrum of diplomacy. The goal is, of course, to build a growing mutuality of values and outlook usually through the instruments of that terrible cliche, you know, what's his name, something Joe Nye the science guy, I call him Joe Nye the soft power guy. <laughs> you know, and I'm a bit skeptical of some soft power, but still, they do have a value. Because what we're trying to do is to build a mutuality of interest through things like scholarships and fellowships, which I do believe very, very strongly in, film, television, social media, etc. But it's really about building real relationships with the full spectrum of civic society, as well as the sovereign good government as well. Okay. Diplomacy, first of all, involves patience. You bet it does. Diplomacy between governments, between just two governments, is a very difficult, time-consuming process, which involves reconciling two countries' divergent interests. And this is not just with hostile powers, it's with friendly powers. I remember, you know, God, I remember bilateral aviation negotiations, mother of God, you know. American Airlines desperate to get into Heathrow, the British side wanting cabotage rights, i.e. the rights for British Airlines to fly inside the US. Blue bloody murder. I mean, they're really tough, those things are really tough. And that's just bilateral when we're, you know, one to one. And that was just between the two closest allies um, in the world. Bilateral diplomacy is tough. Multilateral diplomacy, such as Secretary Kerry and his negotiating team uh, have been engaged in with the so-called, with Iran through the so-called P5 plus one, that is the US, Britain, France, Russia, China plus Germany, is blue bloody murder. Can you imagine what it's like? I mean, leave the Iranians out of it for a second. <laughs> leave, look, just leave them out of the, the frame for, for just a second. Imagine what it's like trying to reconcile all those different points of view. It's very, very, very hard. It's blue, bloody murder. And let me be frank. I'm speaking as a former diplomat here. Let me be frank with you. Perfection is never, ever, ever on the table. It's not. It's just not. Very good is rarely on the table. Right? Rarely on the table. But if you work hard enough at it, good can be on the table. Right? Good can be on the table. 
and must be attainable, otherwise you get out and you walk out. The best way to get it, of course, is to ensure a better mix of military force and diplomacy. And I do believe very much that military effort is not an alternative to diplomacy, it is an enabler of diplomacy. And let me quote to you a great German statesman, Frederick the Great, that diplomacy without a credible threat of force is a little bit like a conductor without an orchestra. Okay? And I very much fear that because there was no credible threat of force against Iran, that Secretary Kerry had a much harder time than he might have needed, that he, he, than he might all otherwise have had. I think New York Times columnist Tom Friedman got it exactly right when he wrote on the 22nd of July in his comment, and I'll quote, um, from the minute Iran detected that the US was unwilling to use its overwhelming military force to curtail Tehran's nuclear program, no perfect deal overwhelmingly favorable to the United States and its allies was ever going to emerge from negotiations with Iran. The balance of power became too equal. Now, I respect Secretary Kerry very much. I respect and admire his tremendous strategic patience and his extraordinary commitment to achieve as good a diplomatic outcome as possible. I think there are big pluses to this agreement, which are getting drowned out in hyperpartisan comment. There are some weaknesses to it too. I'm extremely uncomfortable about you know, giving the Iranians back 100 billion to somewhere between 100 billion to 150 billion dollars of Iranian frozen assets, which I'm sure they will some, use some of it for schools and hospitals, but I fear the bulk of it's not going to be used for that at all. And that's going to make the Middle East even worse, perhaps. But nonetheless, President Obama's obvious unwillingness to use force, President Bush before him, his unwillingness to even come together with a coherent policy about force, limited, I think, what his Secretary of State could achieve. But let's also remember, perfection was never on the, never on the table. OK. Diplomacy, I think, also requires imagination. And one area where it particularly requires imagination is in the South China Sea. As you may know, China has been this novel technique of building new islands. I mean, we've, we're long familiar with, you know, we're long familiar with countries squabbling about who owns what island. That's old diplomacy. But this, this one's really new. It's really interesting, isn't it? You build new ones. Really interesting, isn't it? And you've got squabbles going on about uses of natural resources and all of that. Because the problems in the South China Sea are especially dangerous. But they're not intractable. They are not intractable. China has changed the facts on the ground, there's no doubt. By building these artificial islands in the South China Sea, in advancing an extremely dubious claim to hegemony over that area. And for now, I'm afraid they hold the upper hand. But it's quite wrong to believe that there's nothing Washington can do about it. Of course it can, obviously, in terms of use of military force. Secretary Carter, Ashton Carter, has been absolutely right in saying we're going to sail wherever we're going to sail and we're going to fly wherever international law allows us to fly. That's fine. That's great. That's fine. But it doesn't solve the underlying problem. And just a suggestion, as an example, I hope that diplomacy can be um, imaginable, can be um, imaginative. It's quite wrong to believe that there's nothing we can't suggest. In fact, a little imaginative diplomacy might be helpful. Here's my suggestion. We need a new structure of maritime governance in the South China Sea. We really do. We don't have one at all. Nothing at all. And I think it could help. Modeled on a body that already exists, most people have never heard of it. It's called the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council. Now established in 1996, the Arctic Council gives all countries that border the Arctic certain rights. It gives them a ministerial level mechanism, that's at Secretary of State level, through which they can address Common concerns, common challenges. The next new administration, I think, could propose a similar multilateral body through which the US and all of the countries that border, that border the South China Sea could get down to the difficult diplomacy of negotiating to resolve access to natural resources as well as the conflicting claims to sovereignty over the various islands, both new <laughs> islands and old, in the South China Sea. I mean, there you've got a situation where, you know, sailing where we've got a right to sail, 
flying where we've got a right to fly. That's fine. That shows will, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. A new structure of maritime governance would actually help solve the underlying problem, and we've got it in the Arctic Council. My God, even Vladimir Putin, for God's sake, abides by the agreements in the Arctic Council. Even Putin does, and that's saying something. He doesn't abide by much. I first came across him when he was KGB station chief in Dresden. All right, next one, subordinate one, is enforcing presidential red lines matter. They really matter. If you're going to lay them out, you better be prepared to stand behind them. Otherwise, In 2013, President Obama stated that if Assad's Syrian government, this awful government of Syria, used chemical weapons against his own people, then the United States would retaliate with force against his regime. Well, we all know what happened. Assad used chemical weapons, and we did not punish his regime. We drew a red line, and we didn't do anything about it. Right? Instead, in what remains for me an absolutely incomprehensible reversal of policy. The president turned and asked Congress for authority to use force. I mean, this is a simple punitive action. I mean, pardon an old British imperial note on this, but it's called punitive expedition. You don't need to go back to your legislature for it. The president's got plenty of authority as commander in chief to do it. But when it was clear that this was not going to be forthcoming, the president was totally flummoxed, but he was rescued by none other than Vladimir Putin. God, God, that was a wonderful moment, wasn't it? Except, and this is something most people don't recognize as well, except that it, there was just one teeny weeny weeny little problem with all of that. It didn't really work. Right? Now the UN and others have been championing, saying, oh yeah, we got all the chemical weapons out of Syria. They didn't. They didn't. Once again, you know, if you don't enforce your red lines, all sorts of unpleasant things happen. The administration and European allies celebrated the dismantling and removal of, quote unquote, all Assad's chemical weapons. But the US intelligence community has concluded that not only has Assad maintained his chemical weapons research facilities to make chlorine based weapons, but that he never accounted for the rockets used to deliver sarin gas, which killed over 1,400 people. My point here is not just to criticize the Obama administration's foreign policy, although it certainly deserves it on this, on this, on this point, but to highlight a point made so effectively by a former British Army officer, Emil Simpson, in what to me is a groundbreaking book on the nature of war and diplomacy. It's called War from the Ground Up. 21st century combat as politics. And I quote from Emile's book. He says, and I quote, although the activity of armed forces um, often remains crucial to achieving a political result, military activity is not clearly distinguishable from political activity. The outcomes of contemporary conflicts are often better understood as a constant evolution of how power is configured and related to different audiences, and how that configuration is adjusted through the application of a variety of means, sometimes military, sometimes non-military, sometimes violent military, sometimes non-violent in a military sense. And I think Emile's point that, quote, military activity is not clearly distinguishable from political activity is actually not anything new in effect, really, if you stop to think about it. If you go back in time, I'm a historian by trading, so do forgive me. But if you go back in time to the Berlin Airlift of 1948, what extraordinary success that was. A wonderful success it was, 1948. The preservation of the Allied position in Berlin, the creation of a free, democratic West German Federal Republic, and stopping the spread of Soviet power in Germany. That's where the challenges were. And it was accomplished. Those are key diplomatic objectives, but they were accomplished by an awesome display of American non-violent, but military, American military and indeed British military air power. 
every 30 seconds there was a huge C-47 or a British Avro York landing in Berlin's Tempelhof airport bringing food, water, and even coal, <laughs> even coal. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And it accomplished a very, very great deal. By the way, it was conceived and executed by an extraordinary military officer, General Lucius Clay, West Point class of 1915 military governor of Germany, in effect, in effect, um, <laughs> in effect, prime minister chancellor of Germany of the Federal Republic of Germany, in, in effect, but Lucius Clay did a hell of a good job. He launched the Berlin airlift on his own authority, and then the administration came in behind him, mm -hmm. behind him. Okay, now, Sky, one or two that you, those are my exemplar prize, but some of my own, full ones, full ones here. One of the things Sky didn't mention in his very, very kind interview, is that I'm, in his kind introduction, is that I'm also the founding director of what we call in the Sunni system the CAT, or CAT Center for um, American Constitutional Studies. And I love the American Constitution. I yield to no American in my admiration for America's founders. But in the execution of foreign policy, the Constitution matters. It matters. So I'm going to be handing out some brickbats here on a bipartisan basis. The Constitution gives the President wide discretion in the conduct of foreign and security policy. There are, of course, however, no absolutes when it comes to presidential war-making powers and foreign policy powers. There aren't. But the Constitution does clearly divide treaty-making between the President and the Senate. The President or his Secretary of State may negotiate any treaty they wish with any foreign power, friendly or hostile, subject to those wonderful phrases from the Founding Fathers, the advice and consent, advice and consent of the Senate. What this means in practice is that the President's diplomats shall consult, consult with the Senate before they go to negotiate, negotiate when they come back on breaks, from various breaks in the actual negotiations. They will seek input from the Senate at each stage of the negotiations, thereby ensuring at least a good widespread political support for the treaty when it's submitted for ratification at the end of the day. As the late Caspar Weinberger, President Reagan's former Secretary of Defense, used to always say about Congress, said, if they're in on the takeoff, they're in on the landing. Right? If they're in on the takeoff, they're in on the landing. Now, not everything needs to be a treaty, of course. There's something called executive agreements. Now, executive agreements um, are used for temporary purposes or more routine purposes um, with other states, such as status of forces agreements. Right? However, nuclear weapons agreements with hostile powers are anything but routine. They are anything but routine or anything but temporary. And if a nuclear deal with Iran both its great strengths and its weaknesses. But if a nuclear deal with a hostile power like Iran does not rise to the level of a treaty, I do not know what the hell does. I don't know what the hell does. No future president should ever follow President Obama's example in bypassing the Senate over this Iran deal of taking what is clearly a nuclear weapons deal with a hostile power. We just did one with Russia several years ago, the START Treaty, which again was a model on the whole of how this is done and passed overwhelmingly in the Senate when it came, when it came, when it came back. But I stress, nuclear weapons deals are not routine and they are not temporary. And they should never, ever, ever be executed as simple executive agreements. They should not. If that doesn't rise to the level of a treaty, I don't know what does. No true future president should ever emulate what President Obama has done. Okay, that's the Democratic brick through the window. Now comes the Republican brick through, through the window on this. Equally, Congress needs to insist on its constitutional prerogatives and also to prevent individual senators from acting unconstitutionally. Let me be clear. The corker carbon iran Nuclear Agreement Act is no substitute for a proper, ex properly executed Senate 
ratification treaty requiring a supermajority for a treaty to become law. Corker Cardin, for example, does not require congressional approval for the overall agreement, merely a veto-proof majority in both houses to prevent the president giving Iran sanctions relief by himself. That's not the way the founders wanted the Constitution to work. But the Senate also needs to learn to patrol and control its own members effectively. If President Obama's actions were unconstitutional, and I believe they were, so were those of Senator Tom Cotton and the other 45 Republican senators who signed on to a letter to the Iranian government. Now, if they wanted to express their concerns about the negotiations, that's perfectly fine. That's what the Senate's job is. Address it to Secretary Kerry, address it to the President. That's perfectly fine. But to address it to the Iranian government, thereby undermining the Secretary of State, undermining the President's negotiating authority. By the way, the Supreme Court has ruled on that point repeatedly. You, it is unconstitutional to undermine the President, the President's negotiating authority. It is unconstitutional. Ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution matters. It is not an optional extra. It is not an optional extra. Now, next one. Hard power matters. You bet it matters. And what I'm referring to here is not just military budgets, but it's also how hard power is executed and the mutual respect that should exist between the commander-in-chief and his military and diplomatic advisors. In May 2011, the then Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, in my judgment, one of the best defense secretaries that we've ever had, gave the commencement address at the University of Notre Dame. And in it he said, quote, more than any other Secretary of Defense, I've been an advocate of soft power, of the critical importance of diplomacy and development as fundamental components of US foreign policy and national security. But make no mistake, the ultimate guarantee against the success of aggressors dictators and terrorists in the 21st century, just as in the 20th century, is hard power. The size, the strength, and the global reach of the United States military. Now, what I want to refer to here is, first of all, how they should work together. The key principle, and again, please forgive me, Bush 41. Bush 41. Anne Scowcroft, General Colin Powell. That's the model of how you do it. That's how you do it. The president's job is to define the political objectives of any military campaign, and then to mobilize the resources, both the political resources, the diplomatic resources, the, to execute the job. The commander in chief should question, and where necessary, challenge his military advisors respectfully, respectfully recognizing their expertise, honoring their courage, and honoring their service. Something, by the way, Secretary Rumsfeld was appallingly bad at. His disrespect for his senior officers was absolutely appalling. Above all, commanders in chief needs to understand and appreciate the military culture of selfless service. Equally, the president's military advisors should never, ever be company men. They shouldn't be. Yes, Mr. President. Yes, sir. No, sir. At West Point, we call it, at West Point, we call it the following. Critical thinking is not insubordination. Okay? Critical thinking is not insubordination. Above all, the president, through his NSC staff, should never, ever, ever micromanage military operations, either directly himself, as Lyndon Johnson did, or using his NSC staff. But remember what Secretary Gates said, hard power matters. In the 21st century, as in the 20th, the size, the strength, and global reach of the United States military is critical. And yet, my friends, by any indicator you would like to choose, the size, the strength, and the global reach of the United States military is in serious decline. Consider the Army, the service which I work most closely with. It is to shrink to 450,000 by 2017. That is a force so small that as General Ray Odierno told Congress recently, 
it puts at substantial risk, quote, our ability to conduct even one substantial major regional conflict, even just one. We used to hold us ourselves to the standard of two now because of sequestration and cuts. And by the way, to understand how much defense has been cut, just let's step back from this for just, for just a second. Compare the size of the US military in 1990 with where it is now. In 1990, at the end of the Cold War, the United States Army had 172 combat brigades. It's now down to under 90 and falling. That's one, basically, that's um, 172 to about 95 at the moment. In 1990, the Navy had 546 warships. Today, it has only 273 and shrinking. In 1990, and I have to mention the Air Force, of course, in 1990, the Air Force had 4,355 fighter jets. Today, about one and a half, one and a half thousand. Now, to be sure, military technology has improved. Of course it has. But numbers matter at the end of the day. And there was a time when there was a bipartisan majority in Congress that supported defense at an adequate level. What we are doing to ourselves is stupid unilateral disarmament at a time, I mean, just think about this for a second. When global threats are going up, we're cutting our defenses? Huh? That used to never happen, but that's where we are. Almost done. Next principle, and it's a foreign policy principle, it may not sound like one. Fixing our broken political system is a top foreign policy priority. It is broken. Our allies and our adversaries know that our political system is broken. I remember sitting at a table in London just about a year or more ago, and a group of investment bankers, major investment bankers, were saying to me, Ray, what the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? What's gone wrong with Congress? Have they gone totally mad? Just a few weeks ago, there were audible gasps of relief in allied capitals throughout Asia, when on the second attempt, President Obama barely secured fast-track authority for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, other allies in Asia, Japan and others, they had all taken on their domestic, their unhappy domestic interest groups. What in God's name, allies asked, was taking the United States so long? The answer, we all know, is political polarization. The growth of what I like to call a more extreme, more ideological brand of politics, whose proponents view compromise as akin to treason. Right? You might recall, or you might be aware of, the great 1985 movie, Wall Street, you know? Gordon Gecko, you know? Greed is good, you know? Well, no, it's not. Compromise is good. Principled compromise is good. But somehow, we've lost it. But I think there is something we can do about it. Now, the reality is that today, it's almost impossible to build cross-party consensus for any kind of reform. In the short term, there's nothing, I think, nothing terribly much we can do to rid our political system of this terrible, dangerous disease. It's just too deeply ingrained in our political culture. But what we can do is stop this polarization of our culture getting in, translated into, or if you will, embedded into our political system through something called gerrymandering. Gerrymandering. Our old friend Jerry, okay? It refers to Elbridge Jerry, then governor of Massachusetts in 1815, who, I'm afraid sadly, though a signer of the Constitution, uh, succumbed to the temptation of drawing boundary lines to help his own party win the state house in Massachusetts, and it's only gotten worse. For, it's only gotten worse since then. But there is something we can do about gerrymandering. But by the way, remember how serious a problem it is. North Carolina, 2012, okay? 13 seats. The Democrats won the majority of votes, in fact, quite substantial majority of votes, for House seats in North Carolina. There's 13 of them, right? So you would expect, if the boundaries were drawn properly, we'd have a roughly sort of seven to six majority for the Democrats. But we didn't. What we had was an eight to five majority for the Republicans, right? Because they gerrymandered the boundaries, right? 
they'd fiddle the boundaries. There are salamander-shaped constituencies. There's one district in which I live whose boundaries remarkably resemble the hind leg of our beloved dog, Honey. You know, the hind leg that goes up and goes down, the paw comes down here. Yeah, this is what we've done to ourselves. This is what we've done to ourselves. Now, happily, the US Supreme Court has opened the door to a solution by affirming in June of this year the constitutionality of independent commissions for drawing US House boundaries. It won't get rid of the underlying political, the underlying problem in the political culture, but we can actually, now it's up to the states, to go and emulate the experience of Arizona, California, and others in creating genuine independent commissions. Oh, by the way, let's think about joining the rest of the democratic world. You know? Canada draws its boundaries by independent commissions. Britain does it, Germany does it, France does it. Every other democracy does it except the United States, for God's sake. This is nuts. It's absolutely crazy. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And, you know, transforming the way in which Congress is elected, transforming the way it actually operates, the solutions are all out there. Everybody knows what they are. Let me just refer you to a couple. And by the way, I have to tell you, it's an all candor. The dice functionality of Congress makes the United States a laughing stock around the world. It really does. It really does. And, you know, distinguished experts on uh, the Congress like Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann of the Brookings Institution, have laid out all the excellent, the reforms are all out there, in two excellent books, by the way. One is called The Broken Branch, the other is called It's Worse Than You Think. <laughs> and it is worse than you think. I'll give you one very fast example. You know, for God's sake, they argue, let's get rid of the filibuster in the Senate. It's a joke, and it's an archaism. Get rid of it. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. We know, for example, Alice Rivlin, Great, former Federal Reserve um, board member, former head of the Office of Management and Budget, and on a good bipartisan basis, Senator Pete Domenici, our former senator from New Mexico, have set out 10 steps. Very clear, simple steps to fix the broken budget process. And God knows the budget process is hopelessly broken. It's all there, we know what to do. It just takes political will to get it done. Oh, uh, lastly, money. I believe in the great principle espoused by Bonnie and Clyde back in the 1920s. Right? Right? When asked, you know, when asked, you know, <laughs> why do you rob banks? They said, it's where the money is. Right? And I recommend Congress um, adopt the Bonnie and Clyde principle. Right? Go where the money is. The money's not in discretionary spending. It's not, and it's not in the, in the defense budget either. It's in entitlements. It's in Social Security and Medicare. That's where it is. Last year, the US put out $800 billion. The Social Security outlays were $800 billion. The defense outlays were nearly $300 billion less than that. Right? We have become, an, we've become basically an entitlements and interest-paying federal budget. Right? Depends on, some, some economists would argue, it's about 61%, some say about 63%, but it's in the 60% range. Can you imagine this? 60% of the US budget goes out the door on a formula to pay for Social Security and Medicare and interest on the national debt. 63%, approximately between 61 and 63%. Of the and it's getting worse every year. It's getting worse every year. Discretionary budgets are vital. For example, how many of you have smartphones? The bulk of us have smartphones. What makes a, what makes a smartphone smart? The, oh, well, yeah, but what makes the smartphone actually technically smart? Yeah. <laughs> the internet, right? Who invented it? It was not Al Gore. <laughs> not Al Gore. It was DARPA. DARPA, exactly, which the federal government. Sorry, guys, the federal government. Okay, GPS, the Air Force, federal government, right? And yet we're told, oh, yeah, we've got to cut discretionary spending. Yeah, that spending that supports innovation, science and innovation, that's critical. Ours is bear is steadily been steadily going down. The Chinese have been going way up. That is the source of wealth in the future, right? We've got to fix it and fix it now. We cannot have a budget where 61, 63 percent goes out the door in entitlement spending. It makes no sense whatsoever, does it? It doesn't. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, very much. You've been very kind. Thank you.
I was going to say that you have uh, emulated the, uh, I don't want to emulate the long-winded um, uh, British statesman whom Winston Churchill once said that he had, um, he had exhausted time and encroached upon eternity. Do you believe that the Spratly Archipelago will become a center of gravity in terms of world military and world policy? It could be. Yes. And what I'm going to do is repeat the question, you know, will the Spratly Islands uh, in the South China Sea become the center of gravity of a potential military confrontation? Short answer, it could be. It could be. Uh, China's aggressive foreign policy, its buildup of its naval strength, its aggressive doctrine um, has prompted nations there. The Philippines are building up their military strength. They're going to buy several frigates. The Australians, by the way, who have huge budgetary capacity, God bless them, the Australians. Would, would that we had Australia's problems. You know, Australia thinks that a 30% GDP to debt ratio is a problem. They actually haven't had a recession in 35 years. Ours is 90% and growing. But anyway, the Australians have now launched a big defense buildup, and they're right to do so. But what we need is solutions to the underlying problems. That's why my suggestion for maritime governance, for shared mar maritime governance. But if we don't, you betcha, it's going to become if the, it could well become the Sarajevo of the 21st century. To which I'll simply add it might help to begin with ratification of the Law of the Sea Convention. Indeed it would. There, yeah. There's a novel Indeed idea. It would. Rat yeah. Senate ratification of an actual treaty. Yeah. Oh. And, and I'll just summarize the comment. No, you're absolutely right, Paul, that, the, uh, um, that it was really at the highest level. In fact, this was a, I'll just add parenthetically, this was a, um, um, almost vicious, maybe, uh, debate between the vice president and the president, between Vice President Cheney and yep, President Bush, George W. Bush, about whether the United States military should be on the table as a credible instrument as a backdrop to negotiations with Iran. And President Bush made the decision that no threatening to go to war with Iran was counterproductive. I'll just use that word. Um, and, uh, and, that this, and, and then you also made the point, I think quite rightly, since I'm old enough to remember that, um, that in the wake of Vietnam, we also, the American public, not just the president, the American public did, simply did not have the appetite for engaging in military conflict, military interventions overseas. So another a threat to use force would probably, in democratic political terms, may not have been terribly credible, even if Mr. Cheney had won the argument. Yeah. Can I, I just I add to that? that? Yeah. Thanks, Guy. Can I just add to that? Secretary Gates, who's nobody softy on these issues, made the point very effectively, you can't bomb knowledge, right? You, you can't. And his view was, I mean, the US Air Force, it, to bomb their facility, yeah, it could be done. Of course it could. But the point was, his estimate was, and I respect it very highly as Secretary of Defense, if you bomb the facilities that you, we know they have, at best we would have set their program back about five years. At best, about five, about five years, right? And that's a big problem, you know? It's at, a, at which point they would have actually absolutely have gone um, for a nuclear weapon. Uh, uh, decided that they actually wanted to be a nuclear weapon state rather than a nuclear weapons capable state. Yeah. Neither are terribly desirable, but I would prefer the nuclear weapons capable piece uh, than a very angry, um, uh, vengeful uh, nuclear weapon arms yeah. state. And that, by the way, is just thinking of it purely in Iranian terms, if you want to think about it, in terms of the Persian Gulf, right? The Straits of Hormuz, they're only 28 miles across, and they're at their deepest about 280 to about 300 feet, right? Um, the US Navy is the most powerful Navy, and I know they've been carefully preparing for it, but things happen, you know? The plan never survives contact with the enemy. And the Iranians could easily have sunk a couple of big super tankers and created huge problems, huge problems. I mean, it wasn't just the military action, but it was, it was the side effects, the consequences, which would have led almost certainly to their, certainly would have led to their attempt to um, close the Straits of Hormuz and other you know, stepped up attacks on Israel. You know, who knows? Be careful, you may be sounding like a dove. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to say this, if I, can't, if I oversimplify, tell me. Um, you know, 
what's the role of values in American foreign policy? Is the role of values to project and impose and have them be the centerpiece of foreign policy, or do we say, we're great, we're wonderful, we're exceptional, we're gonna sit back over here and we're just gonna shine our light and let others follow us if they want to? That's a bit of a caricature. And whether or not you engage in foreign policy with non-like-minded. Right, and then, and then as, a, as a consequence of that, do you deal with the people who don't think like you? To which I'll simply add, if we only dealt with people who think like us, we would be having very small conversations. <laughs> exactly so. Exactly so. Remember, however powerful the United States is, it has vulnerabilities. And during the Cold War, for example, um, the United States chose wisely to engage with the Soviet Union because we needed to reduce the cost of nuclear weapons, we needed to maintain stability, and under um, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, we achieved the first of those um, arms control limitation agreements. Those were very, very important. And, you know, we, we had to negotiate. It didn't, mean we, it didn't mean we were all of a sudden, we turned into a bunch of communists. And if you think Henry Kissinger is a communist, of course not. But you have to, you have to enter into negotiations, but preferably from a position of strength. Ronald Reagan was absolutely right on this point. Ronald Reagan negotiated from a position of strength and the Soviet Union came around and agreed to much, basically, the vast bulk of what we actually wanted. But you are vulnerable, because even the United States, at the height of its power in 1949 and 1950, okay, the Soviets had got the bomb, right? And fairly quickly, they found the means to uh, deliver it, albeit rather simply through bombers, right? You know? So they are the means to blow us up, and we the means to blow them up. We were both enormously powerful, but we were both enormously vulnerable, right, at the same time. So it made absolute sense to talk to each other, and it also made sense, I think, to avoid, to avoid you know, inflammatory rhetoric, which a normally sound you know, president like Eisenhower indulged in with you know, the, the we're going to liberate when rollback was the strategy. I mean, come on, what are you going to do? Are you really going to launch everything the US Army has over the Iron Curtain? It wasn't going to happen. Um, and it was, it was wrong, and it was a betrayal of all of those who worked with our intelligence community to say that we would. It was wrong. Um, that said, sir, I'm sorry, but the United States is the world's, um, I'm not gonna say, you, don't, you Americans don't like this word, policeman, you don't like it. So I love American Westerns. Sheriff. sheriff. America's the world's sheriff, I'm afraid it is. And you've gotta be good at rounding up the posse and then going after the bad guys, right? The bad guys are gonna hit you. And what are you gonna do about it, you know? You've gotta hit them back, sometimes, you really have to hit them and hit them hard, right? And the US, whether the American public likes it or not, is the world's enforcer of the rules of law. Now, by the way, the US is not doing this out of charity, right? It's not. It's doing this to enforce an international rules-based order that it is the biggest single beneficiary of, right? It is, right? So, for example, you know, when, going back to 1986, when U.S. servicemen were attacked in, on or and or in, um, bar, in, at a bar in uh, West Berlin by the Libyans, President Reagan very quickly ordered military action, and he bombed Tripoli. Yeah? Right thing to do, in my view. Um, sometimes effective and swift military action is necessary. And I'm sorry if the American public don't like that. Tough. Sorry. I mean, and we need a president who's going to be willing to stand up and say, look, folks, I'm really sorry about this. You may not want to do it, but there is no choice, right? Because the US is engaged globally, you know? There are fleets all over the world, way too small fleets, by the way, uh, but they're always gonna be engaged and somebody is gonna take a pot shot at us. And if you think that we're drawing into isolationism, or I, I'm, sure, I'm, um, I'm sure you don't, but there are some Americans that do. Remember the last time the United States withdrew into isolationism. Remember what happened? World War II, a conflict that was much worse than anything that could have happened by US military and diplomatic intervention, you know, in the 1920s or in the, or in the, or in the 1930s. Sometimes that military option is the most important option, sometimes. And by the way, the skill is knowing how to blend the diplomacy and the military option and hitting back hard. And sometimes you need that carefully calibrated option, which Lucius Clay gave to President Truman, which is, okay, 
uh, what are you going to do? Well, one option, you drive you know, an armored division down the Autobahn from West Germany into the Berlin, and you're going to end up with a shooting match with the Russians, you know, with, with Soviet Union. That didn't make any sense, given what our position was. Our position was to maintain our, our role in West, in West Berlin. And Lucius Clay had the great idea, well, OK, what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to show the Russians that we're not going to be pushed around. Okay? We're not going to be pushed out of West, of West Berlin. Oh, and by the way, we also want to get the Germans on board with us to see that we're really the decent, we, are, we really are the good guys in all of this. And we were. And so, on his own authority, he gets the Berlin airlift on, underway. And the Soviets, it drove them nuts because we had done exactly what they couldn't imagine us doing. It was the non-violent use of military power. I'm just going to add, can I just add Please. two quick words, and then, and then we'll come to you. Um, one, um, enlightened self-interest, I like that phrase. Uh, enlightened self-interest includes knowing whether or not you have a usable military option. Sometimes exactly. you do, sometimes you exactly. don't. Yeah. And it's important to know the difference. Exactly. Um, but second, I want to come back to your point about diplomacy with people who don't think like us. Because there is a growing view in the United States, and very prevalent amongst a lot of folks in Congress, that we don't talk to people unless until they do it our way. <laughs> that the ultimate concession to Tehran or Havana or Pyongyang or anybody else, the ultimate concession is that we'll talk to them after they have done what we want them to do. How's that working out for us? Yeah, not, very well. not very well. And 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 I, mean, I would and I would just simply say, had we taken that attitude towards the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China in the Cold War, I really doubt that any of us would be here today. Yep. Mm -hmm. And exactly. so you have to deal, you have to deal with the, you know, what was it, hold your, enemy, hold your friends close and hold your enemies closer, right? Or as Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, less, uh, uh, <coughs> less, less, <laughs> uh, less, less glibly put it, uh, I'd rather have him inside the tent pissing out rather than outside the tent pissing in. And, you know, that's what diplomacy is, right, Joanne? That's what diplomacy is, right. Joanne Cummings, our resident diplomat. Yep. Uh, and, and this gentleman... Uh, I just had one very, very fast point to that. Okay. Jim Baker, Bush 41's Secretary of State, went and saw the current Assad's father in the run-up to the Gulf War, because this is how you do foreign policy prudently. President Bush the Elder knew that force was going to be necessary, that economic sanctions were not going to work against Saddam Hussein. So he very skillfully, because he knew most of the world leaders personally, but he worked those telephones all the time, mobilized them, but he sent Jim Baker out as his personal envoy, and everybody knew Jim Baker was speaking for the president. Do you know how many times Jim Baker went to see Assad Sr. in the six months leading up to the Gulf War, where the United States really just absolutely crushed them, right? 17 times. He went to see Assad. And by the way, the Syrians even sent an armored brigade along to help us. They were part of our coalition. They were part of the coalition, yeah. All right. Uh, Russ, you had a question. A, a, quick, sure. yeah, okay. a quick summary, uh, a very valid point. Actually, you, you were agreeing with, 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 with much of it, but I want to get your comment on it, obviously. Uh, the premise that China's economic growth, that the, the power is shifting from west to east, uh, maybe it's not zero sum. Uh, maybe it no. is zero sum. It can be. Uh, that's a debate you and I can continue to have. Um, but the example that Russ uses is, is, is that Russia and China, in many respects, have been, we're, we're the source of innovation. They're the source of imitation. Um, oh, I like that. That's good. That's good. We can do that. Um, um, and I should note, by the way, the Chinese uh, actually did uh, devalue the renminbi again. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are feeling for, uh, economic pressures and so on. So say a couple of, and another valid point, Russ, that you make is that we have a tendency in our own, and I'll insert my word, not yours, hubris in looking at others in the world and is, is uh, in exaggerating a threat uh, in part because we want to exaggerate it. Uh, we want to believe that it's bigger uh, so that we can take certain particular responses to it. But we all certainly overestimated, and there are countless other historical examples, uh, overestimating Saddam Hussein in Iraq, overestimating Chinese economic power, and all the rest of it. Uh, what I want to do before, since we're running out of time, and, and, there, and therefore we want to kind of close the formal part, we'll stay in chat as long as you want. Uh, Jeff, can we get your question on the table as well? And, and, then, and then you can close mm -hmm. up, relate to both. How's that? Right. 
As a student of American politics, do you see any candidate out there, if you care to mention one, um, uh, that combines the willingness to, to be strong, but also the willingness to have empathy, to listen, uh, that excludes a number of people I can think of right off the bat. Um, <laughs> including a certain New York billionaire. <laughs> yes. Second question. Can I, um, can I take your first question for us? We will, have to respectfully we will have to respectfully disagree. This is not a question of innovation. It's a question of money. money. Right. Look at the realities. Um, we have had the privilege of meeting together here for, in the formal part of the program for roughly, roughly about an hour, right? Okay. During that time, China has basically, China's foreign exchange earnings have grown by $64 million, right? In just that 60 minutes. Um, numbers are numbers, and they don't lie on this one. China's foreign exchange reserves are now over $3 trillion, right? The United States foreign exchange reserves is $580 million. Okay. Um, 60 years ago, the US was able to come to the rescue of Europe with a Marshall Plan. $13 billion, God knows, I mean, call it a trillion dollars now, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, a huge sum of money. This time around, in trying to, and quite apart from all the ridiculous, you know, frankly, sophomoric amateurism of, of Cyprus and the Greek party and all of that, leaving all that aside, when it came down to matters of pounds and pence, dollars and cents, euros, etc., the United States had to sit on the sidelines because it didn't have the money, right? And the Europeans, I mean, Secretary Lou, Jack Lou, was on the phone saying, hey, guys, you know, don't you think you should give the Greeks a little bit of debt, debt relief, and so forth? And they said, hey, Jack, you know, nice to hear from you and all that, but you've got no skin in the game. You haven't got any money, right? The Germans have an exposure of roughly $100 billion, right? Where's your exposure? You don't have the money. You want to come in and help, but you haven't got the money, right? We don't. That's the, that's the basic problem. If you look at any bilateral trade relationship, right, where the US used to dominate in Asia, China now, and it's not just China, by the way, Singapore. Do you know that Singapore's per capita standard of living is 30% higher than that of the United States? Singapore, this summer is marking another 50th anniversary. This time, not the Beatles, but this time is six, the 50th anniversary of their independence, right? Of their independence. In 1965, Singapore's GDP per capita was $500, right? right? It's now over 69,000, sorry, it's now over $79,000. That's way higher than American GDP. It's, this is dollars and cents, pounds and pence, right? That's what's happening. They have a sovereign wealth fund, which is essentially a state-owned investment bank, right? They are investing around the world at a pace you would not believe in. You know, we used to think there was something called the Monroe Doctrine. Well, I think we better think up something fast soon, because the Chinese are investing through their sovereign wealth fund all over South America, right? Why? Natural resources, right? They are, you know, now they don't do it very skillfully sometimes. They're, they're, you know, they can be, I mean, <laughs> some leaders in Africa have been heard to remark, we'd love to have the British and the French back because at least they were decent. <laughs> at least they were decent. The Chinese often cause huge backlashes um, against themselves. But the money, sir, with the utmost respect, the facts are facts. Money is money. Numbers don't, numbers don't lie. Right? Numbers don't lie. One last, and I'll give you a quick quote from a senior partner, Goldman Sachs, with whom I've worked for many years. He said, look, Americans need to wake up to the fact, he said, that the United States and indeed the West, i.e. US and Europe, were rescued by Asia. If you look at where those monies came from, Morgan Stanley, for example, was on, its, was on the point of going under. It was rescued by Asian money. That's the truth of the matter, you know? That's the truth of it. Right. The second question, presidential politics. Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, yes. This is a nonpartisan operation. Let me put it this way. I would, like, I would like to believe, I've not seen much evidence of it yet, but I would like to believe that Jeb Bush has some of it. Uh, he's his father's son not his brother's brother. He really is. He's his father's son. 
and that comforts me a great deal. But I've just not seen some very impressive performances yet, but I do think he has a lot of that, a lot of that potential. Um, I tell you, Marco Rubio impresses me a lot. He does impress me a great deal. He's a young man with an extraordinarily swift and, and a swift and sure mind. I think he's got a lot of, a lot of uh, potential. Um, a lot of potential to grow. We'll have to wait and see how he grows. I mean, all we can comment on at the moment is possible potential. That's all we can comment on at the moment, uh, is possible potential. Uh, by the way, I think there is at least a serious possibility that Hillary Clinton may be forced out of the race. There's just too much baggage. And the constant, I mean, basically, her evasions over the email issue, which just gets worse and worse and worse as it goes along, um, it, it's brought to most people's minds, anybody who was alive and, and who was, was an active voter in the 1990s, all the Clintonian stuff. You know, you know the Clinton's premise is very simple. We'll do great things for you, right? We'll do great things for you. We're going to do it our way on our rules. Thank you very much. And we're going to do it our way on our rules, even if that means having a server in your home in Chappaqua, which, you know, any competent hostile intelligence service could hack into. And, you know, Joe Biden may get in. Who knows? Even John Kerry might get in. I don't know. But the problem that the Democrats have, they've, they've got a talent bench that is pretty small, you know, very small. Uh, but um, I think there's that possibility out there. But I think all we can do is judge on potential at the moment. And I'll simply remind you that the World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. The views of my speaker over which I have no control. And I've tried to be reasonably bipartisan. Any particular thing or not endorse. Actually, when I was asked that question in Corpus Christi about four months ago, I just simply said, none of the above. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think that's a bit harsh, Sky. I think that's a bit harsh. I think there is, there is, uh, there is potential. There is potential, and I see certainly amongst but two see, of them. I was president of, or, or past president of a World Affairs Council. And you're used to saying this all the time, I remember, yeah. We are, oh, we are well over time. Thank you for your indulgence in all of this. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.